And so I took Kurt out that afternoon. I kept the heart and we went out in the ranch that afternoon and said a prayer for the deer and thanking him for giving us all this, being able to pursue him. And we buried it. And I seen Kurt like three or four years ago. And that still sticks in his mind as the coolest thing he ever dealt with when he hunted. Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 222. Tim Gothier, exploring ozone, hunt one buck, hunt the mature buck, and Kirk Gibson's home run. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Today's show is sponsored by The Enforcer. Take control of your odor footprint with your personal ozone generator. Covert scouting cameras, remote cameras for hunting, wildlife, and security. Morse's Sporting Goods, a full line of sporting goods without the sales tax. And Big Buck merch. For only $19.99, you can get a cool, high-quality Big Buck t-shirt and show support for this podcast by visiting www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash M-E-R-C-H. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hey, this is Dr. Ken Nordberg. You're listening to my favorite podcast on the internet, Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm Fred Eichler, and you're listening to my favorite podcast on iTunes, Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Hi, I'm Jim Shockey, and you're about to listen to my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, fellow predators. My name is Jay. Thank you for tuning in to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. For Dusty Phillips and Jim Keller and the entire staff here at the Big Buck Registry, welcome to this week's show. There are a couple things I'd like you to do for us if you could. If you would, please check us out on iTunes. Subscribe and leave us a review. With your help, we're going to try and push this show up the iTunes charts. I know we have a lot of listeners out there and I need you to take some action. I need you to leave a review and subscribe to the show. If you do subscribe, that'll give you access and notification each and every week that a new show is released. You can also access this show in its entirety on YouTube, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, and Google Play. It's all right there for you to access on demand at your fingertips. Regarding the harness program, we have an ample supply of harnesses to give away from our volunteer donors. If you're in need of a full body harness, please send an email to j at bigbuckregistry.com. In our last visit with Tim Gothier in episode 166, we covered a variety of topics, including Tim's backstory, his father's influence, his experiences filming and hunting all over the world, and some of his basic tactics that he uses in the woods. In this show, we dig a little deeper into ozone and how it should be used, an ever-changing outdoor industry environment and what it means to the enforcer, more of Tim's tips and tricks for hunting whitetail, his hunt one big buck mentality, how he prepares for a hunting trip, and the story of how Tim guided legendary Dodger hitter Kirk Gibson on a whitetail hunt for a buck called Frazier. We'll turn to our interview with Tim Gothier in just one moment, but before we get there, let's turn to Jim Keller with the Deer News. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Our first story this week, deer hunting season begins in Montgomery County. This story is from the WTOP, Washington's top news website, and is reported by Mike Merlo. Deer hunting season has begun at Montgomery County Parks in the state of Maryland, not far from Washington, D.C. The annual deer population management program will take place at parks throughout the county now through January 2018. Deer overpopulation results in overbrowsing, especially of native plant communities on parkland and also residential landscaping in the neighborhoods which surround parkland, said Ryan Butler, a principal natural resources specialist for Montgomery County Parks. Another growing concern, according for Butler, is disease. Although deer are not a direct contributor to Lyme disease, they are the host for adult stage of the tick, Butler said. At Great Seneca Stream Valley Park in Gaithersburg, archery hunting is already taking place. Shotgun managed hunts will take place during the season. In more urban areas, certified park police sharpshooters will be used. They will conduct hunts from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. when parks are normally closed. Hunters have been 
pre-selected and their backgrounds checked from those who registered for the hunts earlier this year. Parks will remain open to the general public while archery hunting is taking place. The 10 parks where shotgun hunting will be allowed will be closed on the days of the hunts. Hunters get to keep the deer they shoot and kill. Park police officers gave the deer they got to the Capital Area Food Bank, which has seen more than 247,000 pounds of deer meat donated from the hunts to date. Montana Wildlife Federation criticizes Arby's elk venison sandwich promotions. This story is a subset of a report on the KTVQ website, as reported by Jonathan Ambarian. A Montana sportsman's group is raising concerns about a popular restaurant chain's promotion to highlight the start of hunting season. Arby's announced Monday it will offer a limited-time elk sandwich at three Montana restaurants, including one in Billings. It's also offering a venison sandwich at more locations after introducing it last year. The Montana Wildlife Federation criticized the announcement because the restaurant chain will use farm-raised elk and venison. In a letter to Arby's executive director, Dave Chadwick said elk and deer should remain wild animals. He said game farming went against the spirit of Montana's hunting culture. Chadwick asked to talk to company leaders about alternative ways to celebrate hunting in the state. The Arby's Corporation was probably well-intentioned in their desire to celebrate the start of hunting season in Montana and across the nation, he said. They certainly probably had the best of intentions, but it's not the best way to honor our hunting heritage in Montana. Chadwick said game farms can contribute to the spread of disease like chronic wasting disease and that they are often used for what he called unethical shooting of animals. Game farms were banned in Montana in 2000 after a voter-approved initiative. Arby's released a response to the wildlife group's concerns on Tuesday. We work closely with a supplier in New Zealand to source our limited edition venison and elk, the statement said. We use the meat that is grass-fed and free-range farmed using responsible practices. Arby's is headquartered in Atlanta. The statement said that the company has worked with the Georgia Wildlife Federation to better understand policies on serving game. Men plead guilty in deer importation case. This story is a follow-up to a story we reported on a few weeks ago. It's from the clarionledger.com website and is reported by Brian Broom. A pair of Louisiana men pleaded guilty to importing live white-tailed deer into Mississippi. According to the Department of Justice, Southern District of Mississippi, Edward L. Donaldson Jr., 75, and John Jared Oderling, 42, both residents of Pearl River, Louisiana, pleaded guilty this week to conspiracy to violate the Lacey Act for importing live white-tailed deer into Mississippi. It is illegal to import live deer into Mississippi, and under the Lacey Act, it is against federal law to transport wildlife across state lines that were taken, possessed, transported, or sold in violation of any law or regulation of any state. Donaldson and Orderling admitted to conspiring to import live white-tailed deer from February of 2010 through November of 2012 in interstate commerce in violation of state and federal laws. Donaldson and Orderling manage a 1,031-acre high-fenced enclosure in Forest County known as Turkey Trot Ranch. The property is owned by Jill Marie Donaldson, wife of Orderling and daughter of Donaldson. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry's Deer News. For links to the stories featured this week, please check our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. If you have any ideas for future topics or have any questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Thank you to Jim Keller with the Deer News. Without further ado, here is Tim Gothier. Tim Gothier, welcome back to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friend? Good, Jay. How are you doing? I'm and doing. Dusty, how are you both? Yeah, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. well. I'm doing well. It's it's been about a year since we last spoke. You're on episode 166, and we, we talked quite, about quite a bit of stuff back then. And in particular, uh, we talked about your your family tradition of hunting, and talked about a lot of uh, filming wildlife, getting familiar with wildlife, what you did to get close to wildlife. Uh, talked about hunting that older deer and how I think more or less uh, you're, that's like your strategy um, in deer hunting these days. You pick one buck and only one buck and it's a theme that we've talked about a little bit here and I think it's a great strategy and I want to get into that further down the road. Uh, but what, one thing that has come to light here for you and me and uh, all our fans uh, and people that um, are familiar with the Enforcer there, there's been a change, and the winds of change, uh, you know, you can't really control them, much like you can't, as you mentioned, control uh, hunting a, a big deer. But you know, things are going to happen. So I was wondering if you, we could first talk about 
the change with Sound Lock and the Enforcer and what's going on there? Sure. Um, well, as of about two and a half years ago, we come out with the Enforcer, I think, a little over three years ago. And I had worked over the years with, with Scent Lock, uh, with some of the past owners, Greg Sesselman and Mike Anders, who's now his past, and really trying to fire them up and educate them on ozone. I thought it was a really good relationship between their carbon alloy and ozone technology as, you know, the new leader in odor control technology. Um, and so that went on for quite a few years. Uh, we finally come out with the Enforcer. And as of about two and a half years ago, we actually license signed a license agreement to be able to use Scentlock's name on the product. Okay. And so for people who are familiar with the product, all the packaging and the dealers, the whole nine yards, it's it's always been called the Scentlock Enforcer. So, you know, like you said, things change in this industry, uh, like the weather, very hard to predict. Um, you know, uh, but you can take advantage of change too and competition as well. So we had heard through the grapevine that Scentlock you know, they really weren't standing behind the product too much. And I've been pretty much their customer service with ozone related products for quite a long time mm -hmm. and heard that um, they were actually thinking of coming out with their own product, which was sort of tough to swallow. But, you know, that's big business and, and um, just got to go with it. So as of probably three weeks ago, talked with Scentlock and we're actually pulled the name off. So now it's strictly called the enforcer, okay. same unit, same product. Um, all the customer service, everything that your, your uh, listeners have been dealing with has all been through us, SLA technologies. <clears throat> so we decided again, all our products is to be the enforcer. Um, I, I think it's a great name, you know, a typical enforcer. If anybody knows about hockey, that's the person that goes and cleans up the ice and so I, I think it's really fitting. Uh, people really know about it. And so what we did is we're really starting to promote more of the enforcer zone. In fact, that's what our booths are going to be called. A lot of marketing is going to be enter that enforcer zone. And the enforcer zone is pretty much what our products are for. And that's for taking control of your odor footprint. And the only way to take control of your odor footprint is by being in an enclosed area. I think you guys know you've used a product now for over a year mm -hmm. and to be able to apply the right amount of ozone, depending on the severity of odors is huge. And, you know, through all our scientific testing, all our research, all of ozone's testing and research besides OSHA standards, which is outdoor ambient ozone is all done indoors and it's all done in enclosed areas. So you can take control and apply the correct amount of ozone. Yeah. So, you know, it's a change. I'm going to, Sutlock was a great company, um, but when it comes right down to it, they're, they specialize in carbon technology, carbon alloy, and we specialize in ozone. And so we're going to continue with our great customer service, you know, standing behind our product. Um, you know, we create ozone products for hunters. We are hunters and we're going to continue to, uh, go forward release new and better products we actually got a couple i can't really share right now that are coming out that i think are going to be incredible additions to our our product line um yeah. and so yeah so that's sort of the big buzz i mean it's changed so much from you know we have so many large conglomerates now coming in and buying out different companies and creating their own and I really believe that us hunters are really sort of hurting ourselves as well when you're dealing a lot with Amazon and and all these large mega um, giant retailers, you're losing that customer service. And I think we did that, you know, when the larger department stores come out, it really hurt the smaller dealers. Um, and then now social media is coming out and it's hurting our, our uh, large box stores and stuff. So, but what everybody's neglecting is the fact that when that little archery shot's gone, they're going to have no customer service. Um, and so I, I just hope that our industry can start thinking about more about where they're going. Go to your local dealers, you know, get your products there. They can educate them on it. They can take care of great customer service. And But the world's changing fast, and it's um, it's hard to keep up with. But there's one thing we're not going to do, and that's – forget about our customers. So right. 
Gotcha. So yeah. Well, I, I I love the little unit. I think it's I've used it on so many different applications. I've used it in bathrooms. I have used it in my wife's car. Uh, she bought a used car and it had a smoker smell to it. We used it in that a couple times and, and knocked it way down to the point where you can't smell the smoke anymore. Um, I've used it in all hunting applications. I use it almost daily. Now, when I come back from my hunt, first thing I do is I, I throw it on the hour supply in my tote and I let it rip and put all my clothes back in there. So it's they're always being uh, washed, so to speak, with ozone. Every single night. Correct. Love it. Took it on my trip to Maryland, uh, expecting it to be warm, but it actually ended up being cool. But I was still able to you know, basically live out of my Jeep with the tote in, and the ozone uh, treatment in the tote. So it's such a convenient little package that produces a heck of a lot of ozone for uh, to the point where you can smell it and your clothes absorb that ozone smell. You can pull them out and they smell like ozone. Um, but still at a safe level, as you discussed. Right. Like we admit 20 milligrams of out, of out of that unit, which doesn't seem like a lot compared to some of the other competitors that that they're using different ozone generators. But we're wiping out a hockey bag in three hours. So we're trying to educate the industry a lot more about the use of ozone and how to use it correctly. Um, and you don't need a lot, a lot of ozone to do the job. I sort of say it's like if you're a Parkinson's patient, there, there's a re- and you take 10 pills a day for your disease. There's a reason they don't give you 10 all in the morning, that they space it over a 24-hour period, and that's because it's probably harmful. Well, I believe that using too much ozone on applications, we already know that it will work on elasticity of clothes over an m- amount of time using ozone, and that's high concentrations of ozone. So we've got a product that... We're admitting enough to do the job, but I would rather, for instance, we had a freezer go out, a buddy's out and he spoiled. Freezer went out, he cleaned it out, he wanted to throw it away, but we put it in for three hours and you opened it and you could still smell it on the rubber seals. You could still smell a little, little puget smell. And uh, we put it in for one more hour and it's still in this house. So again, I would rather, and I feel that everybody needs to apply less ozone to do the job correctly. And so, yeah, it's um, it's worked out incredible for me over the years and a ton of other people. I mean, my pro staff is just tearing them up this fall and just got a lot of great testimonials mm-hmm. and uses. And the versatility of the product, like you say, it's it's something you can use year-round on unlimited applications. So that's right. the beauty of it. I do love it. My son's an athlete, so I've used it in his gym bags. <laughs> um, I've used it in a cooler that I accidentally forgot that there were some uh, meat scraps in it after a week, and uh, it got kind of, I mean, really rancid. Dumped it out, cleaned out the cooler, still had that residual rancid smell in it, but then I put the, the ozone uh, generator inside it and closed the lid, and then enough then it, it would disappear and I, my, I literally walked the cooler which is a decent sized cooler up to my wife said smell this she goes smell what i said exactly this thing's you were <laughs> exactly this thing smelled like cheese a week ago and now it doesn't yeah ozone is just an incredible it's the number one oxidizer besides chlorine in the world right. you know it's and it's it's incredible how you use it you just the, the whole thing we're trying to do in our company is educate the industry on how to use it correctly Um, The other competition has did a great job at educating the industry that ozone works. Mm -hmm. It's just I think there's a lot more education needed um, to, to, you know, for people to use ozone in in different applications. And, um, you know, they use it in hospitals, you know, uh, restaurants, grocery stores, casinos. I mean, you name it. They use a lot of treatment, um, but they apply a correct amount. Uh, so it's healthy for people to breathe, but we walked in, uh, to shot show this year and both by my partner and I, we walked into a casino and looked at each other and went ozone. We could smell it right away. And when you think about it, the old days when they smoked, you could smell it everywhere in your rooms, everywhere. And you cannot smell smoke at all. And people are still smoking in casinos. So, you know, there's so many different applications from cleaning food to, you know, countertops to disinfecting to, Lyme disease and cancer treatment. It's just un- unbelievable. Right. And the more we research it, the more we learn how incredible it is. So, right. Yeah. And, and you brought up a good point is that ozone used correctly is safe. Ozone used incorrectly is unsafe. 
and the, the amount that your generator puts out is, is minuscule, but still extremely effective. And, and obviously, I mean, you don't want to go breathing this thing direct in from the, the unit. That's, that's a really bad idea. But if you put it in the tote in a, in a uh, secluded area where you don't have to suck it in the whole time, com- completely, completely fine. I mean, vitamins are poisonous to you if you take too many. Of well, them. you know, what you're saying, Jay, is absolutely correct. But at the same time, nobody's ever died from overexposure to ozone or any right. knowledge of that. Ozone has five side effects of dizziness, shortness of breath, headache, watering of the eyes, tightness of your chest. And uh, it's sort of like altitude sickness or being narked when you're diving. And I've had it, both of them happen to me. You just reacclimate, get away for a couple hours. Ozone only will last having a, a, a half shelf life of 25 minutes within two hours. If ozone hasn't broken down from odors or bacteria or mold or mildew, it's gone. Right. So, you know, side effect to get away from it, you come back, you're fine. Um, the thing is, is the whole rule of thumb is if you're using like our unit, for instance, in a vehicle and you're pointed behind you, you got a bunch of hockey kids and you're trying to kill all the hockey the smell from all their bags seeping when they're traveling on a traveling league or something. And all of a sudden you start smelling too much ozone when it's not pointed directly at you, shut it off. It's did its job because our unit doesn't admit so much that it would be almost over amount of ozone. So, you know, again, another layman uh, sort of term I tell people is it's like filling your truck up at a gas station. Right. If you, you get a whiff of gas once in a while, and that's okay. But if you stick your nose in the gas cap, you're going to get dizzy. Right. So, again, the concerns of the consumer is understandable. But I, I've yet to hear too many people talk about household detergents. And, of course, none of us use whole – they're nasty. They're not government regulated. There's some nasty stuff that have tenfold more side effects than ozone. Um, but it's they don't even have to put it on the – you know, the spray bottle or whatever, but you don't see people going and spraying it up their nose either. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, so right. again, it's just how you use it correctly. And uh, when used correctly, it's, oh God, I keep saying this and I got to quit, but knock on wood in six years, I've not been blown at a tree stand and I don't use it outdoors. So right. I'm doing something right. Right. Gotcha. It's a, it's a game changer for myself as far as I leave the woods and, and I'm headed home and, and I need to stop and get gas or stop and get something at the gas station and take home for dinner or a grocery store or wherever my buddy's place. You know, before I would change all my stuff and tuck it away and it was like a top secret mission every time I went to the woods. But um, once I got the enforcer in my hands, it, it really changed the way I, I, I don't care anymore. I, I can always treat it when I get home and it, it'll be clean by the next day. Right. That, that was a game changer for myself. Uh, that, Dustin, it is. You had an experience with the enforcer last year, actually in a hunting application uh, where you treated all your, your equipment and clothes with it and then actually went out and shot a good buck. Do you, you want to share the story with us a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's uh, something that I won't, uh, I won't go to the woods without myself being treated with. Uh, real fortunate that uh, the enforcer got in my hands, and, and I try to every time routinely – you're going to get odors from your vehicle. You're going to get odors from just the air in general, uh, being around your house or wherever you're hunting clothes to hang out. At. But uh, you get a toter, you, you treat your equipment, you go in, you spray your boots down, or you, you treat your boots. You can take the enforcer with you right there to the woods and your truck, run it a few times over your clothing before you head into the woods. It'll work for you no matter what. Deer is going to come downwind. They're naturally going to be okay with the smell of ozone because it's created when the weather hits and lightning strikes and it's already in the woods. And they know that they know the smell. They recognize the smell and they're okay with the smell. That's the unique thing about ozone. So once that, once that, uh, that deer gets downwind of you, they're going to get a little hit of that ozone smell. They're going to sniff, 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 but they can't human, human, human. Does that make sense to you? Right. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, 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 I think it's not as much. I think if you got over amount of ozone or using it out there, that's the case. But I, I think that, you know, the amount of ozone the enforcer does put into your clothes, it really doesn't hang around that smell too long in those clothes, even on a three-hour treatment. But it's just the fact that they just can't get wind of you. 
you know, it's just sort of the beauty of it all. And, you know, like I say, if you're out to, I've been out where I've hunted all day long and had a buck walk down wind at five and I've been there since daybreak and had no clue I was there. Well, the ozone smell was already gone. Right. So I, I, I just, I, the biggest thing it does for me is confidence. And the days when I used to, you know, and I still, it's only a tool in your odor control arsenal. It is not a, a final say. I mean, I still shower and with uh, odor-free soaps and shampoos and, you know, I use sprays and, you know, when I go into the field and I don't, I haven't eliminated anything out of my odor control arsenal. This is just, and I get told to a lot of people, it's the best tool in their toolbox. So it's, um, but it gives me confidence. So the old days where a buck could come in, you know, oh my God, she's getting into my wind. He's going to bust me. I better take a shot. Hmm. I don't worry about that anymore, which is pretty awesome. So I can actually spend a lot more time thinking of the best shot at the proper shot, drawing back everything that takes into making that final shot at a nice buck. So that's probably been the biggest game changer for me is that confidence. Mm. So it, 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 yeah. definitely, it definitely changes the way you hunt. That's for sure. <laughs> it does. Right. And you did shoot a nice buck last year. So keep going. Great, great point. Very good. Very excellent point. Let's, uh, let's move on to some, some uh, deer hunting tips and strategies and tactics. Tell me the last time we talked, um, I could tell that you've had many a field experience with with hunting deer, and that your strategies, where you're not just hunting any deer, you're hunting one specific deer or the biggest buck in that woods. It seems, and we've talked about this a little bit, but I want to get deeper into that strategy because I think it's one of those strategies. And Dusty and I have had this chat over and over, and we see some of the bucks that are being killed. They're just like. They're just bucks that people had the opportunity to shoot, but didn't really think that there's something bigger out there to hunt. Or we're not quite sure why people are shooting the smaller bucks. We think they should. We should see bigger bucks being taken. And in in general, uh, it's just seems to me that they're not hunting one particular buck. We're not sure, quite sure why. So I wanted maybe we can just open that up today and figure out how sure. you do it. I so mean, more people I personally. Yeah, I I don't go every time I go hunting for the biggest buck on the property. What I do do is go for a mature buck. Okay. I want to take a mature buck that, you know, and I don't care if he scores 140 or 200. If he's a four or five or six year old, he's as smart with whatever headgear he's got on his head. So I've always said that a trophy is in the eyes of the beholder. I can understand people that. You know, they shoot a two and a half year old buck and it's an A point. They've never shot something that big. That's awesome. Or, you know, I'm fortunate enough to take handicapped kids every year and every animal we shoot is a huge trophy to them. So my whole thing, though, is I love hunting mature deer. Okay. And I think the ultimate hunt, and I've experienced in the past that we can talk about later, the ultimate hunt is when you do go for one deer. And you will not take another deer unless you take that deer. And when you, when that happens and you do, it's like the most incredible feeling in the world. Right. So that sort of, you know, we have, we got a lease in Missouri. And of course we did all the trail cams earlier in the year. And, oh my God, we got some beautiful bucks down there. But from past experience, if you get one or two of them bucks, you know, down in the fall, you're doing really good. Okay. Um, so we know there's some big bucks. That's the beauty of hunting there is I know that at any time, uh, this 190 could walk by me. Um, but at the same time, if I get a chance and a perfect opportunity at a 140, 150 mature buck, I'm not passing them up. I mean, they're, they don't grow on trees. And so, um, and I love to eat Midwest whitetail. So I, uh, I went to Kansas the last four years and you can't take a doe. And I passed a lot of bucks up And this year. It's like, my father always goes, don't you like to eat? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like this year I'm going to, but it's fun. We're going to, you know, I've hunted whitetail ranches and manage, help manage and guide and film at for 20 some years and learned a lot about whitetail, but I've always wanted to sort of manage a, a place that's not high fenced. Right. And, and, um, so that's sort of our goal. So we still practice, you know, you, you take a mature buck, um, you know, 135 and up, or you pay a fine or you don't hunt there anymore. Gotcha. And we just want to let these deer grow. 
you know, and get older. And, and it's not all about having a mount on your wall. It's all about, um, I think Dusty mentioned it earlier. It's about your self, you know, preference of and making yourself prove to yourself that you can continue to make great shots and you continue to be a good hunter and you can continue to have it happen every year, at least getting a sighting of one of these things. So, you know, whitetail and, and bone does something to a man that I, it's been 50 years and it still does the same thing to me. It turns you into a kid. <laughs> you know, and it's, right. we're so excited to come. Yeah, but, you, you just guys, you guys set personal expectations on yourself. And, you know, I'm not saying that, that hunters should go out and kill giants every year. That's not the issue or the point we're pushing here. Right. But as me, uh, as myself, I set a standard and I'm going to stick to that standard. Yep. Uh, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, don't pass on the first day, but you shoot the last day. If I pass him on the first day, I'm going to pass him on the last day because it didn't fit my expectations. Mm-hmm. Now, tag soup doesn't eat very well. <laughs> no. uh, you know, but there's a lot, of, a lot of states where you can shoot a doe and fulfill the tag lead purchase. And, and preference, I would rather shoot that doe than, than shoot a little spike buck or a four point or something of that nature that hasn't lived life, that hasn't been out there. And, and hasn't got educated about the hunter. Uh, you know, here, here in Ohio, a lot of deer come in. They come in, and, and you can almost notify them that you're there. And when they're young, they don't they don't react like a mature deer. They exactly. Don't, they don't sense the danger. They don't yeah. sense the, the death that's upon them. Uh, you know, and I'm not saying it's a lot easier, but a, a younger deer... Is more successful. You get away with a lot more. Yeah, sure. you, you can definitely uh, make way more mistakes and be successful. Where a mature buck, uh, he comes in, he senses something right, he's gone. Yeah, uh, you know, and it just—it's a challenge. It's a, uh, a self-preference. It's expectations on myself personally, and uh, I'm, I'm down for the challenge. I'm, I'm mentally capable of. Uh, forcing myself to set some standards and that's what i my guidelines for my yearly hunts and you know it's awesome use your trail cameras get educated on what deer is in your area before you ever go in and hunt right absolutely you know and and it's i get a a real quick story 20 years ago and it's awesome how that is a lot of the mentality of hunting now is management you know qdma has been huge at that and uh you know letting these deer you know, go so they can grow. But about 25 years ago, I was a guest speaker. I was working with a doctor who actually came up with the concept. He had uh, two bucks and a pen that were brothers. And one was an eight point and one was a spike horn at a year and a half old. The next year, the spike horn was a 10 and the eight was still an eight. And so we had all this, this was right when everything was really, it might've been 30 years ago. I'd have to really think about it, but Long story short, so my father's a member of a large hunting club, 10,000-acre hunting club in Michigan, and I was a guest speaker at Deer Hunter Roundup. And it was all about talking about letting the spike horns go because they can turn into larger bucks down the road. Well, I pretty much, my brother's ate me off the stage because people just were, it, it was in a, it was like a riot. Nobody was dealing with it. We're, you're not going to tell us what to shoot. And I ended half my speech. I was gone before there was a big fight broke out. <laughs> but a lot has changed at that time. A lot has changed. And and it's all about conservation and ethics and, and being a true hunter. And so it's pretty awesome, you know, and it, for us to be able to go and hunt these and have a chance at a beautiful buck is getting better and better every year oh, in a lot of the country. So different, different states, different areas and, and different incomes, that, you know, a lot of times make a difference in what you're shooting. If you're out there and you're going through tough times and you, you need meat in your freezer to feed your family, you shoot whatever walks in front of you. And that's Absolutely. The way that's the way it should be. We're on the same wavelength. That's for sure. Same page. But, uh, yeah, you know, just uh, take advantage of the opportunity that's out there. It's, it's not oh, my gosh. There's, there's huge bucks everywhere. You just got to dig in and find them. I mean, it takes work, it takes effort, and it takes mental power to be able to pass a smaller buck to be able to, to shoot a, a bigger buck. And then that's something yeah. that, that was tough for me to understand uh, for several years. They had yeah. nice antlers that come in. I, I was able to make a great shot. Now it's to the point where it's being able to have a deer that has nice animals come in and say that's, you know, I recognize, you know, that's a three and a half, maybe a four and a half year old, maybe. 
And now I'm going to pass. I think there's better and I think there's bigger. And I, I think that uh, I'm going to be down for the challenge of sitting here longer to try to harvest that bigger buck. And, and that's something that it's a preference and a personal uh, priority that I've set in my own mind. And, and it's great if, if you kill a, a smaller buck, all deer trophies, really. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's just, um, it's a it's a great way to hunt. And I'll be honest with you, when I started years ago, I started going to the UP of Michigan, got our own camp 40 years ago, I guess, and started hunting bigger bucks. And one thing you do do is learn a lot more about deer. Oh, yeah. um, I mean, because you are passing up a three-year-old and then five minutes later, there's a four-year-old comes walking down the same trail that, that you shoot that you wouldn't have shot if you would have taken a shot at the three-year-old or there's just so many other things you learn about deer and their habits and older bucks. I was fortunate in high fence enclosures that, you know, deer is wild and there is there on the outside. People don't understand it. And with the topography of our ranches, it was very, very diverse. And so we would see, you know, one buck all year long. I mean, it was crazy. Or we'd think somebody had taken it through the fence. So I learned a ton about whitetail there, but hunting big bucks and, and going to different areas in different parts of the country and hunting whitetail. And, you know, whether it be the coos deer I hunted or blacktail or mule deer or whitetail, it's just there. I've learned a ton by setting the same standards you have. Yeah, and, it's, yeah. and that's what it's all about. So I, I tell, I tell a, lot of, a lot of people that, uh, you know, become the deer. If the weather's bad, the deer's got to eat. Where's the deer going? And, and you're, yeah. you'll literally walk your woods when that weather is terrible, even though you know it's not the right thing to do, be in the woods when the weather is terrible. But if you're just learning and you want to get some knowledge, let it snow real big. Take a walk through your woods and find where them deer are hanging out. They'll educate you on what they're eating, where they're sleeping, how they're living. Absolutely. Once you, under, once you understand how they're living life, then you know, your success rate will be untouchable. Uh, you know, and that, that's something that you can't. You can only talk about it until you get out there and experience. It's just, just not something that uh, uh, a podcast or a video is not going to educate you how your deer and your energy is going to That's right. That's very true. Very true. Tim, how are you getting ready for Missouri right now? What This time of year, how do you prepare for that hunt? Well, first of all, of course, shoot my bow a lot. Um, but, uh, you know, the beauty of having a lease, too, is really starting to pay off this year. Um, you know, you go to an outfitter and we still hunt Kansas and everything with outfitters. It's all great. But if you have a four or five day window to hunt and you got four or five days of terrible weather or it's 80 degrees or something, it really puts a damper down on your hunting. And so I was going to go this weekend. Um, and I actually, we have a bunch of stands already set up um, earlier this year of good areas and transition points we think would be good. But I actually love to go when the deer start turning a little ruddy, the bucks, and it's not a huge deal. I like to really go in and rescout the property. And so we've got a new 420 that I haven't even, I've been on it this summer, just the front half of it. I still don't know hardly anything about it, but I already seen two or three spots. I set up a stand, but so long story short, I was going this weekend to set up some stands, hunt a couple days, but it's 75 degrees, the weather. And so the beauty of it is we decided, you know, the person I'm going with can take a couple of days off work more. So we decided not to go and to wait till now I'm going to be hunting, the, excuse me, the 4th through the 13th there. So it's going to give me more time, but the weather's good. The deer are getting a lot more ruddy, a lot more predictable as far as, you know, chasing does, tending does, you know, that type of thing, lockdown. Um, and I love the first day, I'll just probably first day and a half, I'll go in at a, at a prime time and the prime time will probably be first thing in the morning. And the reason is it's a full moon and during the rut. And I've seen this endless times, uh, countless times and actually changed some gears and been successful doing it. But on a full moon, the bucks will usually pretty much move all night and feed all night. And then they've got to, you know, they go to bed, they bed, but they can't sit there all day long. They got to get up and move. And so a lot of times during the full run, I'll hunt from nine o'clock till dark. I won't even hunt the first two hours because I, I, I actually have seen the least amount of deer on a full moon first thing in the morning. 
Now, it's different when you're rifle hunting and you have hunting pressure, like Pennsylvania or Michigan, you know, I mean, it's all a different story. But when you're hunting these deer natural, that's what I find. So when we get there, I'm going to be doing a lot of my scouting in the morning. Okay. Um, if I jump one, oh, well, there's does around there. He'll be back. And they're used to farmers. You know, you, they're used to people. I mean, they still haven't got all the crops cut. So they're used to that. So I don't spend a lot of time in there, but I love to hunt over scrape lines. And so I'm hoping to find some really good transitions, depending on what, how the the crops are, the row crops, if they're cut, if they're not, and then throw some tree stands up and hunt them. And so that's sort of my goal for this year. It's, you know, we did preparation as far as rooms and getting all our stuff ready. And, and uh, of course, all my stuff is, I built a 10 by 10 hunting closet called the enforcer zone. And uh, <laughs> right. my stuff's all in there being treated right now. So, um, so yeah, we're uh, getting all prepared, but it's hard for me not to go this weekend. But at the same time as I think it's, I'm able to be able to select the time I do go, okay. which right. is really nice. How often do you shoot your bow in preparation for that? Oh, well, I shoot all, it's been bad this year because I've moved into a new place and stuff. But I mean, I'll, I don't shoot a hundred arrows anymore like I used to, mm-hmm. but I'll go out and shoot. Like last night I shot 24 arrows and I'm just shooting 40 to, you know, 10 to 40 yards and I'm shooting 10 from elevation um 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 and then i shoot on the ground so i'm you know i'm fortunate that i can halfway shoot a bow pretty decent and so i just you know make sure my muscles are built i practice drawing and holding and i I try to hold as long as i can i'm up to about three minutes right now because i really have a real hard let off on my struthers the bow i'm shooting now so um you know, I practice that way. So when that buck comes in, if I draw back and he's standing behind a tree and I got to hold for three minutes, I don't want to be where I can only hold for 10 seconds. I got to let the bow down. So, okay. Gotcha. And is there anything else that you do in preparation archery wise? Uh, maybe uh, certain things you do with the target, how you aim other than holding it for a decent amount of time? Mm, you know, not really besides shooting elevation, shooting off the ground and just knowing where to hold. Okay. You know, I, through all my years of filming and stuff, people don't realize it, but, and it all depends. It's, it's all about knowing the deer too. So right now we're shooting at a solid target, but if you get a buck that walks in and he doesn't know nothing's going on, which is a beauty of the enforcer as well, doesn't know you're there. Well, you can pretty much aim where you pretty much where you want, unless it's a long shot. But if a deer comes in and he's nervous at all, nine times out of 10, they're going to duck the arrow. So I do practice that shooting lower. So in other words, okay, that deer is going to jump where your duck, where am I going to aim? And so I do practice that as well on a standard, you know, on a solid target, but it's just getting that in my head that if that deer is alert, aim low, don't take it out of the body, but aim low. So if he does drop 10 inches, then you still get him. And referring back to my videos, I, Every single video when we played back deer get shot, they were alert. Everyone ducked the arrow. Some ducked right away. If we're running away by the time the arrow got there. So I sort of that's I sort of keep that in mind. Okay. And I always practice when I when I shoot, it's always pick a spot and follow through. So that's like in any sport or whatever. If you don't follow through, you drop your bow to see where your arrow flies. Right. So I, I constantly try to, as long, I've been doing it a long time, but I still got to imprint in my head all the time. So follow through and you watching that point through, through the release. I don't care where the arrow hits the deer. I don't want to see the arrow hit the deer. Okay. I would like to, but if I do, then I pull my bow away. You know what I mean? I drop my bow to see. I just, I just shoot and hold my bow as long as I can until it hits. And then I try to see where I hit them. Um, you know, I sort of take the, it's not, it's more important that I know how to track than it is exactly where the arrow hit, because there's still a lot of things that you see that you think you see that really wasn't the case Right. because right. it happened so fast. So I think a lot of misses are caused by people, you know, cantering their bows or dropping away to see where the arrow hits. Okay. So you're holding- and if you go out and shoot and just try that a couple of times and you'll see what I'm saying, it'll throw your arrow off three, four inches right. sometimes. So so you're so holding a lot. holding on a point through the shot, and then I pick a spot. So in other words, instead of looking at the whole broadside of a deer, 
I try to look at a crease or a tuft of hair or something that automatically makes me start thinking. And then I, I try to shoot that point, you know, um, shoot small, miss small. Okay. It's sort of an, another saying that I got from a TV okay. show by a movie, but it's true. And then you not, know? not until after the release, after you've, 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 the, the arrow has hit its target. You then peek up to go see where that oh, arrow may have hit. Okay. Yeah. If you don't, you're going to, yeah, you, you, you could get them, but, and you, a lot of people do, but you know, two or three inches that can be feet, right. You know, in certain situations. So I just mainly is a mental thing for me is just, uh, you know, don't come unscrewed, you know, if I've, cause I don't care if you, if you don't get all nerved up when you see a mature buck walk in front of you, then you shouldn't be hunting. Right. right. <laughs> so I still do. So I still got to calm down, you know, it's a deer, you know, and, and you actually have to turn in, I always say harvesting animals or, but you have to turn into a killer. I mean, and that is for the safety, I feel, of the deer or, or for the sake of the deer as well. I mean, I want to make the best shot I can possible on that deer so he doesn't suffer and I don't have to track him mm-hmm. for four miles. Right. You know, that type of thing. So I owe that to the deer as well. Yeah. I mean, that, the, the good shot is really for the benefit of, of the animal. Oh, absolutely. Okay. And, and us, so that that you know, the, we can find it, and recover can find them. it in a, a quick amount of time, so you can recover the meat. Right? Are all of your shots, or uh, are all of your hunting positions in this Missouri location? Are they elevated, or are you doing any ground blind hunting? It all depends. We have ground blinds. Okay. Um, we don't have any setup as of. Uh, I guess we do have one in a forty acre piece we have, but most of it's elevated. I, you know, a lot of the stuff we put some beautiful millennium. 21 footers up. Um, so we got them stretched over for a few people that aren't physically able to still climb trees. I personally still love climbing trees and setting up a stand and hunting it. Um, and I don't use climbers and they're no good in Missouri anyway, cause you can't find a straight tree. So, but yeah, if I find a, a spot off a Creek bottom or a bank or something that there's just no way to set up a tree stand, then I'll hunt off the ground. Okay. Gotcha. Do you have a preference? Uh, tree stand. Tree stand. Okay. Yeah, I like to be able to see 360. You know, and I I don't like sticking my head out a window all the time in a blind. Yeah. But whatever it comes down to, I'll hunt in it. So, but okay. ma- yeah, mainly the majority of my hunting still, till I get too old where I'm freezing, is uh, hunting in a tree stand. Gotcha. What other things should we as hunters think about as we're trying to hunt that mature buck on the piece of property when just in general to take yourself from the standard hunter to the mature buck hunter what other little things can we do well i first our biggest thing is i learned the top you know and it's so easy now with google earth to be able to really learn the structure and the layout of the property before you even go in there I try to get certain points that I can access from that are going to be the least obtrusive. Um, and then sort of knowing when whitetail do at that time of the year is huge. So, you know, if you still got a standing crop up and you're, and you're hunting off that standing crop, you're going to, and it, depending on the wind direction as well, I'm not as concerned as I used to be about wind, but I still play it. But if that standing crops there and you know, the deer, are funnel out of there in the morning to go and you're in a bedding area, you're going to want to hunt that blind in the afternoon. Because like Dusty said earlier, you bust a big buck a couple times. You can get away with it once, especially during the rod or when they're out combining and stuff. But you're out just wandering in the woods and in his bedroom and you bust him a couple times. You might get away with it once, but not twice. And so, you know, I don't, when I go out there to set my stands up, I will not be going in their bedroom by any means but i will also in the past where i used to because a big buck will always come and i've heard this from a ton of people and i've experienced it a bunch is they'll always come downwind of their bedding area to sort of smell what's in their bedding area before they enter it right um and so we would always set up you know to where that buck we would be downwind of that and now i've set up if i find a spot that is sort of iffy because i have so much confidence in my order control yeah. that I will set that spot of trying to catch that buck coming into his bedding area. Does that make any sense? Yes. Yep. 
Okay. So that's stuff we do. Um, you know, stay out of there as much as possible. Don't wander around. I mean, the biggest thing people do is they'll hunt for two hours and, and a lot of it goes to outfitters that outfitters know them deer and know that area and know the properties. And the worst thing is these guys getting it, they'll hunt for two hours and then wander around the property. Well, you know, it was, I think it was a little, two years ago or three years ago in Illinois, I had a group of friends go down there and one guy had got out of a stand and wandered and they seen a picture of him on the camera. That's how they found out he, he was walking around at like 1230, 10 minutes later, the camera at his blind this big pig walked in and he was out of his stand, <laughs> you know? So, you know, it's hard to sit all day. Um, I'm fortunate that I've been doing it my whole life in Michigan where some guys out West are going, are you crazy? You know, cause they're so used to spot and stalking and it's tough to sit there all day long, but I try to get in, get in as quiet as possible, you know, less obtrusive as possible. Um, get up my stand and hunt it. Right. So, so, um, yeah, you know, there's so many different tips and stuff, but learning your property and it, again, besides getting on the ground, you can tell where to go into and where to go out of just sitting off Google maps okay. and right. zooming in, you know, and they've got the, a lot of other apps out there now that are even a lot more incredible, you know, as far as property lines and all that kind of stuff right. too. So, yep. which how, I have to download myself. How close to the bedding areas are you setting up? It depends. I mean, in the morning, I will be, I'll go in an hour before daylight and sit in a bedding area. Okay. I don't stay out of the bedding areas. I'm talking about if I'm going in to scout or to decide where I'm going to hunt, mm -hmm. but I, I hunt in bedding areas too, as well. I just won't go in a bedding area and hunt in the afternoon. Gotcha. All right. So you're, if they're there during the day, you'll, you'll stay out. If, if you think they haven't arrived yet, you'll go in. Well, yeah, an hour before daylight, you still got a good chance that they're not in their bedding areas yet, or they're, you know, you're going to take a chance to bust them. Right. Um, that's part of it all. But again, I, you know, I've made spots to where I clean every limb to my blind. So when I get out of a creek bottom or something, I'll sneak in as much as I can. Um, gosh, my cousin up here just shot a nice buck opening day and it was in a field and he couldn't get to it in the morning without busting deer out of it. So he spent the night in his blind. And he got it, you know, so it's, <laughs> it's, uh, you just have to, um, you know, again, I try not to, to bust the property up too much. Right. Right. And, um, you know, try to keep it as natural as possible. Gotcha. So, yeah. Very good. Very good. Doesn't always work, but I've had some pretty good success over the years and, and I've never shot a, a Boone and Crockett buck. I've taken a lot of Boone and Crockett animals, but never a Boone and Crockett whitetail and, you know, my biggest was 150 something. And I've shot a lot of mature bucks, but I've just never had that. I've had some, I've uh, never had an opportunity. I had an opportunity, but it was a long story. Um, cameraman sort of scared a monster eight point in Alberta away. But, um, you know, I just, uh, that's why I hunt mature bucks, but I would love to have the opportunity to take a big buck before I'm gone. I mean, a mega buck, I guess I should say. Gotcha. Okay. So, very good. What, um, we we always talk about memorable deer stories and it sounds like you you've got some a few focus points that you like to do <laughs> when when you're uh, actually hunting yourself um last time we went on a memorable deer hunt it was about your son and mm -hmm. we wanted to talk about a, a different story this year and you said that you actually had done some guiding in the past correct and with a, a fellow who's most appropriately um recognized this time of year Kirk Gibson mm -hmm. Can you tell us the story? Yeah. Uh, well, did, I've known him for a long time. He actually, I played football against him in high school. He was no a kidding. Years younger. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I went to Waterford High, high and Kurt, uh, his dad actually was a teacher and he played for Waterford Kettering at that time. And um, so I knew him back then, but, you know, just passing different high schools and stuff like that. And, and then, um, you know, I was working at a ranch here in Michigan and helping manage it and and I was also guiding and running the deer herd. And Kurt and uh, David Wells, Kurt Gibson and David Wells, booked a hunt with us, and, and which was pretty cool. So I was, of course, Gibby's guide. And, and I went, David Wells had never shot a, a bow before, so I met him in Florida at training camp and actually took him on a pig hunt. He shot his first pig with a bow. And, and now, long story short, Kurt and David own their own high fence ranch in Michigan. Right. So that's how it all sort of led into it. But uh, Kurt got there that first year and we had one buck on the ranch that I could swore I 
thought he was at his peak. I thought he was six and a half or seven and a half. And he was an incredible buck, um, big drop times. And our largest buck of the ranch that we would see once or twice a year. It was crazy. We called him the ghost. And we had 780 acres. So it's pretty amazing that you would never see that deer that whole year. Um, and this was before a lot of trail cams were out and stuff. I used to do all my um, counts with video cameras and driving them. But long story short, so there was one buck that the owner said, you can't let him shoot. And I said, well, did you let Kurt know? And they go, no. And I said, okay, well, we never see him anyway. Sure as heck about the third night, it's snowing like crazy. And right at dusk, here's that here's a big buck <laughs> and scrape. And Kurt's underneath me. And, he, and the buck starts walking towards us, and I'm going, oh, my God. And he gets finally 45 yards, and Kurt, I mean, he used to get so excited that you could actually see his heart pounding on his shirt. And <laughs> and he was fired up, and I had to lean down and say, Kurt, I'm sorry, but if he comes any closer, that's the buck we can't shoot. And I was shocked. Uh, Debbie sort of can go off here and there at times, and we all know him, but he was calm and said, okay. Okay, you know, so not 10 minutes later, a beautiful 160 come in and he shoots it. So he said, I'm going to come back one more time. But he said, I'm only coming back to that one buck and I'm not shooting another buck. And I said, that would be awesome, Kurt. I said, that's the ultimate of hunting to me. And so the guides actually had a little bet saying, oh, he's not going to do that. And I thought him saying, oh, yeah, you will. Because <clears throat> I spent enough time with him and all his competitiveness and everything. So the next year he comes. Four days in a row, never seen that deer. Um, the deer had lost his drop times, and he was probably in the high 190s the year before, and he ended up to almost there. But So the fourth day, we seen him chasing a doe uh, across the corner of a field, and Kurt just came unglued. Oh, we got to go up. we got to check out, see where he's going, blah, blah, blah. And I said, Kurt, there's no sense failing. He's gone with that doe. You know, and Kurt had, so we hunted two more days, never seen him, yeah. and we gave him one more free day. And so he sort of was getting a little impatient and he told me, he said, okay, you know, cause I told him earlier, we needed to put both our heads together to kill this buck, not just one call the shots. And so he goes, okay, smarty, where would you hunt? And I'm like, <laughs> oh my God. And so I said, well, to be honest with you, that blind, we, the tree stands you and I put up the second day. We only hunted them one day. We need to give that a shot. And it was quite a bit of pressure and I was filming with my huge beta cam. So I'm in a cherry tree. And I'll, right. I'll make this real short, but I'm in a cherry tree. Kurt's in another tree. We hadn't seen a deer all afternoon. Two spike horns come in and they're right underneath me sparring. And all of a sudden I look to my left and here's that big buck come opposite way of which I thought he would. Hmm. And he's standing like 40 yards away from Kurt and Kurt's 20 yards in front of me in a tree. I have to move my camera to film him, but if I knock a piece of bark off the tree, then spike horns are going to bust, and it's over. So I don't know how I did it. Got cramped up a bit, but I got around and filmed him, and all of a sudden he comes, he starts walking. And he stood there for a good, I don't know, probably four or five minutes. And finally he just started walking, and Kurt center punched him, and he ran 80 yards and dropped. And so I get out of the tree and Kurt's up pumping his arms like he did when he threw the Dodgers. <laughs> and uh, I walk up to him and um, he comes walking out, climbing out of the tree. And he looks in the camera and he goes, we had a party here tonight. The big boy's down. And then the one thing I remember the most is we had walkie talkies at that time. And he got a hold of uh, David Wells, Boomer. And he started going, Frazier's down, Frazier's down, you know. And it was, it was so awesome. And there was so much pressure, but at the same time, it was so awesome that he did hunt it hard and got that one buck he was hoping for. And um, so just to finalize everything, I do it for myself once in a while, and I did it for a couple of the handicapped kids that I've taken hunting. But that's about it. It's sort of special to me. And so I took Kurt out that afternoon. I kept the heart, and we went out in the ranch that afternoon and and um, said a prayer for the deer and thanking him for giving us all this experience and being able to pursue him. And we buried it. And I seen Kurt like three or four years ago, and that still sticks in his mind as the coolest thing he ever dealt with when he hunted. Right, so right. it was pretty awesome. What, what a great story that is, especially yeah, great story. this time of year, the Dodgers having another run at, at a potential World Series. And uh, Kirk, Kirk Gibson shooting big bucks, guided by our friend Tim Gothier. That's awesome. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. I'm sitting here looking at the picture of it right now. It's pretty cool. And he signed uh, the bottom of the ninth. He sort of calls me the gangster. And uh, 
is my nickname since I've been younger. And, and so he signed in the book, thanks for the awesome hunt. And I don't, I heard he has Parkinson's now and it's too bad. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen him in a while, but still a good friend. And every time somebody crosses his path and brings my name up, he calls me the gangster. So the gangster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I sort of got a little upset of him that morning when the buck, when he wanted to take off after that buck. And I told him to let's put both our heads together and kill this thing. You've been calling the shots all week. So I got a little huffy with him and he sort of remembered me from football and, and so <laughs> he called me the gangster and we did end up right. getting it, which was right. And you put it, it all together. Pretty, That's awesome. pretty awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Our new website, um, it's called enforcer ozone.com or enforcer zone.com. Um, you can per- pick it up there or we also have a dealer locator and, uh, we encourage everybody to, if they don't order online is to definitely go and check out and see if there's a dealer uh, close to you and go talk to them and buy the product for them, support your local dealers. And at the same time as uh, be a little more educated on the product. So, um, but it's out there quite a bit. It's doing well. And we're getting, like I said, my pro staff is on fire this year and uh, taking some really good deer. And I really do after last year, the rut was just off the chart as far as no good all over the place last year. Of course, people harvested deer, but the overall rut was really sporadic with the super moon and everything. And I really believe with the spring growth this year across the country, we're seeing a lot bigger bucks. And I think the rut's going to be just phenomenal this year. I think there's going to be a lot of great bucks taken. So I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping that the enforcer is going to work. I guarantee I'm like Jay. It's like my third arm, so uh, right. <laughs> I carry it everywhere I go, and I can't put it wait to put it to the test and be successful and be able to share another success story of a buck downwind to me and had no clue I was there. I look forward to seeing some pictures from you guys, too. And, Jay, go after that buck you've seen earlier this year. I heard you've seen a nice one. Yeah, yeah. We're, uh, so. we're, we're in heavy pursuit. We'll, we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> Good. see if he outsmarts me this year again. Well, thanks for doing what you guys do, man. You got a great show, and I, it's a privilege being on it and sharing this stuff with you. Excellent. That, I appreciate you coming on the show again, Tim. I, I find you to be very interesting. I know you're very humble and um, about uh, your your skill set and the, where you've been, but I th- I find you a fascinating person, and I, I appreciate you coming on and sharing some stories and uh, telling us about where you where you're hunting and how you do it. And where you've been, well, I mean, you have a very interesting past. Yeah. You know, I've been a very lucky man and traveled around the world and documented all the big game species and hunted. And, you know, the, the biggest thing for me is I'm the, you know, I'll never be a rich man, but I'm the richest man in the world when I'm in a tree stand around top of a mountain. And, and um, that's sort of how I am and who I am. Right. But yeah, I'm very, been very, very, very lucky. And, and to be able to, as you get older, you know, they call it, say wisdom. <laughs> we always said it as we're younger, but after hunt for 50 years, it's, uh, you learn a lot. You learn a lot for sure. You'll never learn every, I mean, you could live 200 years and never understand a white tail, but you still learn a lot and the passion's still there. And I hope it stays until I can't move around anymore. Right. Excellent. Tim, if we have more questions for you specifically, not just about the enforcer, is is there a place that we could reach out on social media or, or other? Uh, you know, I'm, I personally don't spend a lot of time on Instagram, but we do have people that do. Um, but they can always go to our info at um, enforcerozone.com and get a hold of me that way if they're up on to ask any questions through our customer service. Or, um, you know, they can contact me um, through our business line. Um, is on our website and everything and I, I will get back with them right away or share my cell phone with them but our whole goal of our business is continually you know there's automation and animation and machines I'm just getting sort of burnout out on trying to find out about anything you know by calling some customer service and we're gonna I don't care if it's going to be 10 people on staff we're going to constantly talk with people answer questions inform educate and, uh, you know, our customers are our hundred percent goal in taking care of and making sure they enjoy the product. So they can get a hold of me there and, um, I'll be happy to answer any questions and, and, um, do whatever I can to help them out. Cool. All right. So it's enforcer with an E ozone.com. Yeah. 
or enforcer zone. It's just it's it'll go to either one. Enforcer but ozone or enforcer like zone shows, com. The okay. Great American Outdoor Show. All our shows now, all our booths and our marketing going forward will be uh, the enforcer zone. Okay. So whenever you hear the enforcer zone, that's all our products. All right, very good. And I know you said you got a couple of things coming out. Can, can you give us a little hint? Oh. Uh, well, a couple of ones ozone related. Okay. Uh, maybe two as far as another generator of sort that'll do different things. But we've got something that I just can't sneak it out yet because, as you well know, what's happened in this industry, I mean, it changes every two days. And right. and it's sad that these larger corporations and manufacturers are, you know, it's all about money and dollars. It's not like the old days. And um, I've, I'm hoping why I'm alive to keep it the old days. But it's going to be something that's going to be huge. Uh, it's going to be something new nobody's really come out with. And it's going to work hand in hand with the enforcer. So, all right. Well, I'm, I'm, now I got to <laughs> know. Do, oh, right? It's going to be gone. I'll, I'll tell it right now. And in two weeks, somebody else will else be making one. Yeah. That's how our industry's <laughs> going. Point. You're yeah, absolutely sure. right. So, yep. Yeah. Excellent. Awesome. Plan. But I, it won't be long. We'll be sharing it. I can't wait. Now, now you have I know, me. It's pretty now cool. you have my head buzzing. What is this? <laughs> it's good. Makes you think. Yep. Good That's man. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show again, Tim, and, and thank you for doing the things that you do in the outdoors and and creating such a fabulous product. I love mine. Uh, uh, thanks, buddy. Looking forward good, to some some other good stuff. Good hunting for you too. I'm looking forward to seeing some pictures. Thank you to Tim Gothier for joining us on the Big Buck Registries Deer Hunting Podcast. It's always a pleasure to have him on the show. I find him a, a very uh, intriguing and fascinating hunter. He's uh, he certainly had plenty of experience, and uh, I, I enjoyed going a little deeper on ozone and what it means to him. The story about how licensing is done and the, the how the the enforcer got to where it is today, where it was Scentlock, now it's enforcer. Definitely a story that represents the outdoor industry as a whole. It, uh, it's ever changing, ever changing. And of course, Tim always is helpful, giving us some tips and strategies on how he hunts. Certainly knows how to hunt. He's a successful hunter, and uh, love to hear how he preps for hunts when he's going out of state. And the, the story about guiding Kirk Gibson and having him do the arm pump just like he did when he hit the when he hit the home run in the World Series. Fascinating, just a great story. So you can see where Tim's been. He certainly has many connections around the outdoor industry that goes even further than just hunting. Uh, again, thank you very much to Tim Gothier for joining us on today's show. Dusty, do we have a Chubby Tines Tip of the Week this week? Yeah, Jay, we sure do. The Chubby Tines Tip of the Week is sponsored by Morse's Sporting Goods. Firearms, use firearms, bows, use bows. Located at 85 Kentucky Falls Road in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morse'sportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morse's Sporting Goods. Right now, the bucks are really hammering the feed bag, and they're focusing on either cut corn, standing corn, standing soybeans, cut soybeans, fields, um, you know, check check for a big track there. Then you can also find the acorns right now. If you can uh, locate where they've left a, a rub and a scrape line and you got a food source, boy, you're going to be on top of them. They're going to come and see you. Awesome. Dusty, where can we find you when you're not hanging out here in the studios with me? Uh, shoot me an email, dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. You can look me up on Instagram and Twitter at Chasing Antler, facebook.com forward slash chubby tines outdoors. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Likewise, you can shoot me an email, jay at bigbuckregistry.com, and you can visit us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We're also on Twitter, which is twitter.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We are also on Instagram, instagram.com forward slash bigbuckregistry, and YouTube, which is youtube.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. On YouTube, you can listen to all of our podcasts in their entirety. As far as videos are concerned, it's a boring video, but the audio content is there, so you can actually listen to our podcast. You can also listen to all of our live shows that we've done on Thursday nights when we do do them, and we've gone back and interviewed, re-interviewed a lot of our previous guests we had on the show just to put a face to a voice, let's put it that way. You can always listen to our show on other places as well, not just YouTube. We're found on iTunes, iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, and Blueberry. 
And if you would like to submit a buck to our page for consideration and be featured on our page in front of 250,000 diehard deer hunting fans, all you have to do is go to bigbuckredstreet.com forward slash my buck and all of the instructions will be right there. I think that's pretty much everywhere we're at. I think that's a wrap, Dusty. That's a whole lot of big buck, Jay. Sure is. I'm Jay Scott. I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Can't wait.